We're going to call. We're going to call our meeting to order. This is the twelfth day of August, twenty twenty-three. Let us bow and pray. God, our heavenly Father, the Maker, the Creator of the heavens and the earth. Father, we come this morning just to say thank you. Thank you, O oh God, for all the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us. And thank you, you most of all, for your son Jesus, who gave you his life, that we might have life and more abundantly. Be with this city group as we take on the duties and the missions of the city group. Bless each and every one that is gathered here today, including those that are more alive. Bless our community. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You have the uh, you have the agenda. But first of all, before the agenda, we're going to take the roll call. And I'm going to ask Second Vice Chair, Mr. Moses Matthews, if he will do the roll call. Thank you. Roll call. Open County. If anyone is on the on Zoom, please respond accordingly. Wolfen County, Birchie County. Camden County, Carteret County, Shawan, Creighton, Hermitop, Dare, 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 At our last meeting, uh, we had a forum of counties uh, who were presented with a uh, meeting for the last minutes and approved uh, the Eastern City group for their community members. Well, I'm trying to remember, I'm trying to read these notes. Presented the uh, values that we see North Carolina. Uh, I call it a committee got together. And the bank was 
the full body. So next, on the agenda, we have a banquet report, but I, I, as, as, as President, I'm going to deviate a little from that. We do have a letter from the government that uh, I'm going to ask Mr. Matthews if he would read. Happy to. This is the uh, State of North Carolina Office of the Governor. Uh, dear Mr. Stokes, thank you for your letter of recommendation of Judge Eula Reed for appointment as Special Superior Court Judge. I will pass your letter along to my General Counsel, Eric Fletcher, so that he will be aware of your endorsement. I appreciate you taking the time to give me your input on this appointment. I am grateful for your public service. With kind regards, very truly yours, Roy Cooper. Thank, thank you so much, Mr. Matthews. And on that matter, we also, uh, Mr. Seal sent a, a letter to Eric Fletcher as well. So we have let it be known that the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group supports Julie Green as special superior court judge. Next on our agenda is the banquet committee's report. So we will we will do this two part with that. Uh, I'm going to Mr. Becky doesn't know it, but I'm going to lean on him as well with the report. Uh, our banquet will be next week. August the 19th, as we show our appreciation to three of our hardworking former members, former office holders. May McGee, who served as secretary, recording secretary, assistant secretary for the last seven years. Vera Murrow, who served as treasurer for the past seven years. And our honorable James Sears, who has been in the Civic Group for over 30 years, and with over 20 of those years in leadership position. The banquet will be at the W.C. Chance Building in Robertsonville at 3 o'clock next week. 3 o'clock next Saturday, August the 19th. The dress is semi-formal, and we just, we just hope that this will be a grand occasion. Ms. Matthews, if you have anything to add. Sir, we are, the tickets are $25 per person. Uh, we've had uh, recent communication with, with everyone who's going to provide the, the services that will be needed. Uh, everything is in order. Uh, we are, uh, all the participants in terms of um, persons on the program uh, have been contacted and, and we, we feel that everything will go along smoothly. Thank you. Now, did you check to see if if they have the ability to show video? Yes, they do. Okay, good. Next on the agenda is our unfinished business. So the first thing that I want to say is as a reminder to all counties, the importance of paying the assessment fee for being in the city. The fee is $100 per county. If the bylaws are approved, though, if your county does not participate, but you would like to participate, then that fee would be $10 to for, for the year. That will allow you to vote. It does not give you a full county vote. It gives you a tenth of a vote. But, but that gives you the ability to say, to have say so in the ongoings of the Eastern North Carolina City. But we do plead with each county to pay those assessments. 
our unfinished business is the second reading of the bylaw. So I'm going to ask Mrs. Vanessa Smith that she would come and read, have our second reading of the bylaws. And upon the second reading of the bylaws, at our next meeting in September, we will be ready to accept a motion to approve the draft bylaws. So we will have until that time if anyone wants to make changes or suggestions to that. Notice is made not 
be required of duly established meeting towns and places as agreed by the general body. All notices of any special meeting shall state the purpose of the meeting. Section 3, records of county leadership members. The roster of the organization shall include a current list of all five district representatives name and address as provided by the member to the secretary. Section four, quorum. A quorum at all meetings of the member shall consist of the actual presence of one third of the county members eligible to vote. If less than a quorum is present, a majority of the voting members present may adjourn the meeting without further notice. Voting members represented at a duly organized meeting may continue to transact business until the meeting is adjourned, even if withdrawals or departures of members result in the presence of less than a quorum. <coughs> Section 5, Voting. Except where otherwise stated, all matters brought to a vote at meeting shall be decided by a simple majority of the county's presence and voting providing that a quorum is present. The presiding officer shall have the same voting status as other members. Section six, proxy. There shall be no voting by proxy at meetings of the members. Section seven, members. Membership will be limited to those persons who support and participate in the goals, objectives, and ideals of the organization. County membership, will be achieved by paying an assessment of $100 annually. A fully paid county will be assessed one vote in matters before the body. A $10 membership fee is available to persons whose county has not paid the $100 assessment fee. Individual members will be entitled to one tenth of a vote on matters that come before the body. The county or individual assessment fee shall be paid by April 1 each year. Article 4, Officers. Section 1, Officers. The officers of the ENCCG shall consist of a president, three vice presidents, a secretary, and assistant secretary, a treasurer, and other officers as the executive committee may elect from time to time. Section two, election in turn. The officers of the civic group shall be elected by the general membership. Each county will have one vote. Such election will be held in September of odd number years. The terms of each office shall be two years. Each officer shall be eligible to hold for two consecutive two-year terms. Thereafter, the officer cannot serve until the completion of one vacant term. Section three, president. The president shall be the executive officer of the city group. The president shall supervise and control the management of the city group in accordance with these bylaws. The president shall preside at meetings of members and act as the chairman to, of the executive committee. The president shall sign with other officers any instruments on behalf of the city group as may be required or permitted by law. In general, the president shall form, perform all duties that are incident to the office and other duties as defined by the executive committee. Between meetings of the general body, the president is authorized to exercise general executive authority on behalf of the Eastern North Carolina City Group, subject to ratification by the executive committee and or the general body. The president is to perform such other functions and exercise such duties as may be done from time to time by the general body of the executive committee. The president is authorized to appoint committee chairperson subject to approval of the general body or the executive committee. Section four, vice president. In the absence of the president or in the event of death, 
inability or refusal to act, the vice president, in the order of their numerical rank, unless otherwise determined by the executive committee, shall perform the duties of the president. When so acting, the vice president shall have all the powers of and be subjected to all the restrictions of the president. Any vice president shall perform other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee. Section 5, Secretary. The secretary shall keep active records of the actual and proceedings of all meetings. The secretary shall maintain a listing of all standing committees, the officers and members of the committee, and the mission statement that is in the charge of the committee. The secretary shall give notice of all meetings as required by these bylaws. The secretary shall turn over all records and other proceedings to the assistant secretary upon resignation, the inability or refusal to act, and upon any other vacancy. The secretary will accomplish other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee. Section 6, Assistant Secretary. In the absence of the secretary or in the event of death, inability, or refusal to act, the assistant secretary will perform all of the duties of the secretary. When so acting, the assistant secretary shall have all the powers of and be subject to all the restrictions of the secretary. The assistant secretary shall perform other duties as assigned by the president and executive committee. Section 7, Treasurer. The treasurer shall have custody of all funds and securities belonging to the ENCCG and shall receive, deposit, and disperse the same under the directions of the executive committee. The treasurer shall keep full and accurate account of the finances of the city group. The treasurer shall keep full, the treasurer will provide reports to the city group every two months. The financial records will be available for review by the executive committee upon request. The treasurer will provide an annual report and statement of financial status to the city group. The treasurer will accomplish other duties as assigned by the president and the executive committee upon the approval of the general body. Article 5, Committee. Section 1, Executive Committee. The executive committee shall have general control of the affairs and programs of the ENCCG, subject to the authority of the general body and the provisions of these approved bylaws. The executive committee shall render a report containing the reports of all standing and special committees at the regular meetings of the general body. The executive committee shall act as directed by the general body. The executive committee shall be empowered to act in the absence of the general body. The executive committee shall report all actions taken to the body at the next regular meeting or special call meeting as it occurs. The executive committee shall be composed of the duly elected officers of the ENCCG. Section 2, Standing Committee. There shall be five standing committees to the Eastern North Carolina City Group. One, the Committee on Bylaws, Elections, nominations, and operating procedures. This committee is charged with the duties and responsibilities of reporting on all changes to the bylaw and any such amendments to the general body with such sufficient notice given no less than 30 days prior to changes in the bylaw. Likewise, the committee is charged with giving notice to any changes in the operating procedure of the general body. The committee is also charged with creating rules and regulations of all nominations of persons for the various offices of the ENCCG. During odd number of years, this committee is charged with creating a slate of officers for elections at least 90 days prior to the September election date as set in other provisions of these bylaws. This committee shall have other such duties as deemed necessary 
by the general body. Two, the Committee on Economic Development. The Committee on Economic Development shall implement local efforts and support programs to preserve and expand economic empowerment among the black and brown minority citizens of Eastern North Carolina. The committee shall engage in other duties, functions, and responsibilities as necessary to implement economic development to its constituents. Three, the committee in finance. The committee shall plan and conduct fundraising activities, budgets, and financial operations of the general body. The committee shall have such other duties, functions, and responsibilities as approved by the general body. Four, the Committee on Political Action. The Committee on Political Action is charged with creating methods to increase participation of black and brown minority citizens in the electoral process and in governmental operations at the local, state, and national level. Five, the Committee on Social Welfare. The Committee shall implement the social action and social welfare policies and procedures of the general body. The committee shall have other duties and responsibilities as approved by the general body. Section 3, the Ad Hoc Committee. Ad Hoc Committee shall be appointed to research, review, and report on matters of concern to the civic group. The chairperson of the Ad Hoc Committee shall be appointed by and serve at the pleasure of the president. Article 6, Regional Organization, Section 1. Regions of the city group. The counties of the city group are divided into the following regions. A, Northwest Region, region. five counties. Bertie, Halifax, Hertford, Martin, Northampton. B, Northeast Region. Six counties, Camden, Juwan, Carita, Gates, Cascatain, Perquimans. C, Central East Region, four counties, Dare, Hyde, Terrell, Washington. D, Central West Region, four counties, Beaufort, Edgecombe, Green, Pitt. E, Southern Region, four counties. Cataract, Craven, Lenore, Hamilton. The bylaws may, may be amended by a two-third vote of the general body. All purpose amendments to the general body shall pre be presented at least 30 days prior to a duly called meeting and or a regular meeting provided. Therefore, duly and proper prior notice is given. At this point, Eastern North Carolina City Group bylaw has had its second reading. President in charge from here. Thank you, Ms. Smith, for the, that reading, our second reading. I will, I will be so glad when we approve these re, revised uh, bylaws because I think one of the, the part that we need right away is that part with the regional director? She named the counties that would be in each region. We have people in attendance today. We have people on the, our Zoom call. And I want to thank Com Com Camilla. Camilla Stancy for hosting this live on Facebook. So if there's anyone that is listening, 
that would want to be involved, please send an email to ENCCG1 at gmail.com. I'll say that again. The email address is ENCCG1 at gmail.com. Send, send us your information if you are interested because I, I think these regional directors are going to be so important that we got some counties that are not active, so we are asking for volunteers that will be a regional director. So at our next minute, our next meeting, if there are no objections, we will have a vote on the draft bottle. We will have a vote on that. Yeah. Mr. Stokes, concerning the assessment for each county, April 1st is the stated deadline in the bylaw. We actually have gone beyond that. So if someone paid now, would they be due again in January to April 1st? Sure. The answer is... Oh, we're going to wait for assessments until January. We are operating now, and we are operating April 1st. I'm sorry. It needs to be. If, it, if someone pays now, it will be assessed on this year, and in January, it will be time for those students to be paid. Okay. Does everyone understand that? Okay. Mr. President. Good question. I understand it, but will it be prorated on the actual $100? The actual one hundred dollars. Okay. As a matter of fact, our, our treasurer is not here, but I do have a county has reported one hundred that one hundred dollar assessment fee for this year. So I, I will collect that for the uh, treasurer. Is there a question? Someone online, is, is there a question? Okay. But we do, we do ask that everyone get your county to pay that assessment. Oh, here's another county that has paid. It. So this is wonderful. This is wonderful because this is what it takes. Also, I forgot when I went over the but the uh, banquet report, I forgot. Is there anyone here who has funded this? Miss Gray reminded me when she gave me her collection for the tickets. Is there anyone who wants to uh, give their ticket? Okay, we'll we'll collect that after the meeting. What we do not want is we do not want a lot of money next week being taken up at the door. But I've got a feeling people are going to be walking in wanting to pay at the door. So having it is it, it, somewhat difficult for us to tell the caterer how many people are coming. So I just hope that uh, the people who have paid, if we have a, an overflow, that the people who paid and turned in their ticket when they we accounted for are the ones that get the food if we run out. <laughs> yes.
Uh, President Emeritus Sears just just recommended that if you've given your tickets out and, and someone has said we, we'll come in or even if you haven't but someone has promised you that they're coming make contact with that person before Wednesday and just just try to get that money in. I'll say this and I'll stop but oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead and say this. They setting up for 125 too. It's not just a cater. I don't I mean y'all do what you want to do, but they're set up as well. Okay. I think we're gonna have that. Is there another sure. question? Let me ask a question if I may. Um you're saying you're taking up monies at the door. Is there an increased price for at the door people? Well, it's going to be the same $25. The same. We hadn't, we hadn't looked into that at all. So we're just at this point, we'll say the same. Any other questions about the bank? Okay, as we move on to new business, uh, Mr. Matthews, we are going to ask him for a report. Mr. President, we uh, attended the 9 o'clock meeting this morning at Cedar Hill Baptist Church in the Rogerstown area. Uh, when I left, the meeting was still going on. So uh, it was been a Q&A session. But uh, it was all related to the closing of Mark General Hospital. About a week or so ago, um, just some of the uh, recall or the reaction that's going on now to try to see what we can do uh, as a community. I wanted everyone to know that, that there were four county commissioners out of the five county commissioners there this morning, the others are on six. So, uh, very good response uh, from the county commissioners. Uh, there are at least three mayors of various townships and in, in, in the kind of there. Um, we had administrative um, personnel from, from uh, East Carolina uh, health system that uh, took over from Dr. Biden. Um, we had uh, the, the CEO of Agape uh, there. Uh, many ministers were there. Other community folk, um, Senator uh, Candy Smith, uh, the president also. Uh, the discussion uh, centered around uh, one of the key discussions centered around what do we do now? So we, uh, what's happening now with the EMS service? And that's what they're looking at. How do we make sure that, that their uh, emergency now, how do, what will the response be? Um, they're already working on trying to maximize the EMS service in the county. But what they've done, um, they've worked in numbers to see uh, that they can fit some of the demands that the, the EMS managers and, and owners are trying to they're being challenged with in terms of uh, personnel, uh, high fuel costs, and all, all the rest of that. But what, what's key is that uh, right now, and this has already been experienced, that there's a time gap uh, that's detrimental to, to, to our population, We're trying to get people to, to, to the areas that they need to get to. Uh, uh, 10 or 15 minute ride, uh, get the Martin General in the past and now be uh, maybe a 25 mile, 25 minute uh, uh, travel to, to Windsor, Virginia. It's even longer to Washington or Greenville. So it's, uh, those, are, those are challenges that, we, that we're dealing with right now as we speak. Um, and, and the kind of commissioners uh, and, and those folks who are managing these operations and these services uh, working on it uh, diligently. But the, 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 the
County Commission is one of those to, to understand clearly that uh, this is not my community, my Maryland uh, hospital closing uh, as, as spontaneous as it appeared to us. Uh, they've been working with uh, that outfit that has been with us for, for the last decade for years to try to, to mitigate a lot of the issues. Uh, if, if you remember, uh, the maternity ward closed a couple of years ago, and uh, maybe last year this time, the ECU. All of those were, 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 were critical signs to all of us that uh, bleeding was going on. Something had to happen. Well, well the outfit said that we were losing a uh, million dollars a month. 2022, they lost $13 million. So they closed up shop uh, and wanted the Martin uh, County commissioners to check on all the liabilities that, that, that were attached to, to running a hospital facility. Uh, and, and they uh, you know, refused to do that. They couldn't do that. Uh, from the meeting this morning, they said they, they tried to, when they looked at the numbers, our tax rate would have gone up of about six to eight percent. The bottom line is that they are still working to try to find and have been trying for uh, several years of what we understood this morning to try to find a replacement for that outgoing uh, contract that they had. So it's, um, it's, it's, it's still up in the air what's, what's going to happen, how how bad it will impact us for uh, taking the first first uh, and making sure that, that the emergency uh, service can be provided to someone where it gets sick and needs to be one of one of the one of the things that they asked of us as citizens is to, to understand that if you if, if you call the rescue squad and they get you to uh, any one of these facilities, that's a one way that's a one way travel. Um, they are not going to bring you back. So we we are at a point now we got to look uh, not only look out for our brothers and sisters, but we got to look out for our neighbors. And it's a situation where we may have to, uh, you know, that way we will have to change our uh, our, our our habits and our, our mannerisms to be able to extend our services. We can go and, and, and pick up our neighbors from. Yeah. Wherever they are, that's what we need to get in the habit of um, doing during this transition and really work out of uh, this serious situation we're in. Uh, trying to see, I hope I'm not rattling too much, but uh, trying to What's up, Nick? Give, give you the hit, uh, hit, uh, hit points. The other, other request is that uh, how do we. How can we prevent having the need for EMS to come and get us for, for whatever reason? And, and, and conversation. So, right, they have to be charged you if you call the family one way. Can someone mute there? Please mute your mic wherever you are. Thank you. The, 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 other, the other issue is uh, food, uh, our food consumption. And, and what, what's, what they're saying is what we all know. We are what we eat. So um, they, they're asking us to really take a close look at how we can alter our diets so we can food. That's, that's something that we got to do individually um, and, and all our diets so we can improve our health. And, and when they talk about food, the Reverend Jordan, who has uh, a nonprofit out of Canada, uh, he's saying that, and, and, and y'all forgive me for this, but we had a bunch of ministers there this morning too. But a, a bunch of pastors with him. This should be the first one I made that. Uh, anyway, uh, 
Reverend Joyner has uh, non profit uh, dealing with, with growing uh, healthy vegetables and the like, and, and then giving up food. Uh, yeah, getting ready to put some buses in, in, in the service of church. Uh, they're giving up food uh, at the church practice. Seem like people can go in rather than you having a box that uh, maybe some item in there that you don't care to cook or what have you. Uh, they allow you to pick, pick your choice. So um, that's the beautiful thing in this growing. It's encouraging a whole lot of uh, uh, black gardeners, black uh, landowners, and farmers to be able to get into the food growing uh, initiative so that uh, we can get our community. So it's uh, uh, the meeting this morning with the first of several to come, and, and, and they were uh, they, they were levels of optimism and, 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 and the levels of pessimism relative to Martin General Hospital and, and, and where it will be as position in our in terms of serving us going forward. So uh, just just try to inform you. As an individual, each one of us needs to get informed, take the initiative, and, 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 and be aggressive to try and understand and see what each one of us can do to try to make a um, uh, resurgence or return of uh, modern general hospital a reality. This will be a long road, uh, a long struggle to make it happen. One of the things that, um, and I'll close that with my comment, uh, there was a law passed. Emergency rural health. And I may have it somewhere backwards, but it's designed, and that law was passed, federal law was passed in January this year. It was designed to bring funds into the rural communities uh, in terms of what uh, to preserve the hospital health services. Uh, that, that law is tied in with Medicaid expansion. Medicaid expansion is tied in with Governor Cooper's budget that he's waiting for. On, um, for the folks to send him the legislative body to send him so he can sign it. Um, uh, and and uh, Mr. President, we just had one of our kind of commissioners uh, walk in here to like might be able to expand. Uh, because I left the mission of this at the meeting this morning. Uh, uh, I would like to acquiesce uh, at this point uh, on, on the update. Sir.
and, and uh, second vice Matthews touched on the Medicaid expansion, what uh, our Republican officers have done is they passed it, but then they tied it to the budget. And you know where the budget is right now. So even though it passed months ago, it's not that. So we've got to stay on them to pass the budget, to, to get the government's budget through the general assembly. Yes. But so to piggyback on what you are saying, I heard on the news a couple of days ago that they need to get that budget passed by the end of this month because Medicaid expenses is tied into it. And if they don't pay, if the state don't pass that budget by the end of this month, it's going to be December for they even look at the Medicaid expansion issue. So, uh, what I thought about was instead of sitting back taking a reactive position, we need to take a proactive. To each civic group, we need to submit a letter to whomever uh, asking that they work harder to get this budget passed. Because otherwise, I mean, one thing that, that Medicaid expansion will help keep the hospital open. Otherwise, if you don't get that expansion or that budget passed this year, there's it, a lot in there that, that we will lose out on if we don't get passed this year. You know, so I think maybe we can start sending uh, communications of the problem. It's the general assembly saying, you know, please, uh, not please, but we feel like you should. Uh, pushed up, offer more effort to get this budget passed, especially to our representatives. Uh, even though the uh, Republicans are in control, we all know that uh, they got Democrats on that side and the Democrats got Republicans on that side, so they make the big budget through what they put forth a uh, uh, bigger effort than what they're doing. This is them. Are you making that in the make it in the form of a motion? Not if I got to write the letter. How? <laughs> now I make a motion that we send a letter to uh, the governor, general assembly, state that we are uh, uh, twenty three counties strong. Yeah, twenty three counties strong. See, we need to start getting our name out there and say that we're the vote up. Like I was telling my wife, you know, it's not but one hundred counties in the state, and we got three of them on our, I mean 23 of them on our list. So we got almost 25% of the counties in the state. So we should have a big impact on what happens. I mean, we should, we should make it known. I mean, it, it might just turn the nose up, it might just throw it in the, in the trash can. But they, they'll know that there are 23 counties on the east and end that's concerned about the welfare of North Carolina, especially North East and North Carolina. So I make the most that we submit a letter stating our concerns and that we feel like the budget needs to be passed. Because there's a couple other things, you know, kids are pretty wet school. You gotta have teachers, you gotta have bus drivers. So if we need that budget, we got to have that budget in order to um, get some things done. Otherwise, we might as well stay in COVID. Is there a second? Hospitals and closed, all in rural areas. Put the old uh, 
President, yes. Well, could we include those counties, those hospitals that have been shut down? Include them. We could use them. We could state them in the letter. Right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Does someone online have a comment? Yes, I have. I have a comment, Miss Barbara Southam of Prairie County. Uh, I remember when we, I was on before, I remember they was, uh, I can remember the name, she was talking about the Medicaid expansion that was coming. Okay, and I know that they passed it. Remember, Congress passed the Medicaid expansion, and some members were trying to get them not included in the budget, you know, per se, but all the budget was at. But then uh, the majority of them of Congress turned it down because they said they're going to include it in the budget. And, you know, they were saying that was going to be the hard part because they have to pass the budget. And then even if they pass the budget, how much are they going to include, uh, how much money are they going to include in the Medicaid expansion for the budget? Ms. Sam said that was Angela Bryant and that was my comment. Um, Assistant Secretary Angela Bryant, she is usually on our call because we moved it to um, the third Saturday, she could not attend, but she too was on this call, and I would hope that we have some conversation with her as well, since she's been dedicated to providing us information. Of course, she had one of her colleagues to come on, and she can't be here, so I'll send her we will discuss it with her. And um, 
everybody knows on this call that I'm real um, concerned when people say get a civic group name out there. We certainly need to get it out there. Um, but the civic group name has been out there. You know, I think Mr. Smith said to get our name and not try to uh, 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 cause any problems. But I do want the people who just came in to know and have been in. But I am protected saying that this organization has been, has been, her name been out there. Okay. Yeah, you know, I was just sitting there doing all the information on the I know. Because I can not read the paper and I look at the news, you know, I do it, you know, all of it, you know. But I know everything you hear me is not so, but when you tie it all in together, you know, you can, you can come to a conclusion of what's going on. Mr. President, Angela's supposed to get on. Oh, she is? Yeah, I just called her. Okay. Uh, Thanks to Mr. Dancy, we are waiting for Secretary Bryant to join us, who could really give us some information that we need. And, and I, I love what we are doing, because so often we don't worry when it's somebody else's door that's being knocked down, as long as it's not ours. But we realize very quickly how quickly it can happen to us. I'm from Washington County. We've gone through a closure, but we were very fortunate that it opened back up. But it's struggling. Mr. President, there's a hand up for a while. Okay, I can't see it. So, whosever hand is up, you have the floor. Uh, Peter, did you want to say something? Yes, uh, I Okay, okay, this is Brenda Jones, and uh, I didn't know if you were saying you had your hand up as well, so I didn't see it. But I was uh, wanted to comment on what I think is a motion that's on the floor that we were discussing. I thought it had a person moved and seconded uh, about the letter, and my suggestion is if you're going to write a letter to our representatives that is copied to all representatives across the state. We have poor people and people who don't have services across the state, as someone mentioned, another county uh, in the West. So why not CC everyone so that everyone knows that this is a concern? And perhaps that would encourage some of the other districts to get on the backs of their representatives to make sure that the budget is passed in a timely fashion so that the Medicaid expansion uh, happens this year. That's my comment. You've heard the discussion. Are you ready to vote? All those in favor of the motion? Those the bones. The motion carries. We will work, work on the letter and we will get it sent out to all representatives and senators. I, I sent something out to the to the ones who represent the 23 counties. I sent them something on, on another matter, on the banquet matter. I've sent them uh, invitations. We've sent them something else from the city. So, as, as Secretary Selby said, they know the Eastern North Carolina City. They know, and if they don't, they will learn very quickly. And just, just the effect that health care can have on our communities. Mr. Seals and I were in Raleigh at, at a meeting, and we, we met with several legislators were there, and Going around the room talking, I met a man that lived in the the east, the mid, the midwestern part of our state. And I told him I was from Washington County. He said, I bought a house from Washington County on the Albemarle South. He said, I, I visit, but at my age, 
with the health care that is in Washington County, I can't move there. So, you know, we think about economic development, that we need businesses. We got to have health care. We have to have health care. A couple of months ago, we had the Gene Mills Health Care Conference in Rome. And someone, there was a professor who made a presentation. And what the, in his presentation, he said that Pitt County has one doctor for about every 700 people. Washington County has one doctor for every 12,000 people. More Eastern North Carolina, Turl County is even more than that. So if we don't get this Medicaid extension passed, people my age and older, you know, the, the, the death rate is higher in our area than others. And it is because of health care access. It is because of that. So I, I'm very glad that we're moving in that direction to spread the news and ask the state to pass that budget so that we can get some help. And, and the sad thing is, other states approved this years ago. Years ago. But because it was tied to the name of Obama, red states would not approve it. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Commissioner Biggs, this is my first time meeting you. Great to meet you. And, and Mr. Matthews, thank you for your report. Is there any other new business? Uh, I, I have one good thing. Rick, Ms. Jones, were you on for Secretary Bryant or is Secretary Bryant on? Both of you coming on. As well. It's the both of them. I don't have a question. I just had something very quick. Uh, I found out yesterday that a lot of people will be doing uh, taking the photo ID pictures at the Board of Elections office, right? But I found out yesterday there's quite a few offices are not set up. So everybody needs to go back to your county and check to see if they are set up to uh, take uh, photographs because it's being advertised that you go to the Board of Elections and your DMVs to get free uh, voter ID pictures made. I found out yesterday that there are quite a few of them that haven't been set up to uh, do that yet. Now I met with our chair of Board of Elections last week, and he said they had released funding. Yeah, they released funding, but for some reason they haven't brought the equipment in or, or software or something. Because see, I contacted our Board of Elections over a month ago, and they told me that they were having issues with the software. So, but yesterday I found out they still haven't got it up and operating yet. Some other counties are having the same problem. So, well, I'm just saying, check with your um, board of the county board of election and see if they are ready to start uh, changing photographs. Like, so, we will have a um, municipal election in November. And that ain't but, but two, three months away. I, I just certainly hope that all of you that, that belong to a church, that your church is, believes in the holistic man, and that that message be spread in the churches as well, that 
you need to get the voter ID if you don't have ID. Now the one thing that I, I read and I didn't know it until then is, for instance, my mother. My mother, before she passed, had stopped driving. But because when she turned 65, she had a valid license that at 80, she could use that as ID. As long as your license were valid when you were 65, and if you're now 100, and you go in and show that, they have to accept it. Any other reason? Which we're trying to get Secretary Bryant. I'm here. Oh, Secretary Bryant. Yes. Yeah. Please, we're so glad, we're so glad you're here with us. And if you could give us some, some information on the Medicaid expansion. Okay. Um uh, now we, we ask everyone online, other than Secretary Bryant, to please mute your mic. Uh, okay, everyone. Uh, good morning and uh, afternoon now is where I'm going here. Afternoon. Sorry to be late. Uh, just juggling a lot of uh, obligations here this morning. And thanks to uh, Camilla's dance for uh, poking me and reminding me that, and that you all were wanting information from me, and I appreciate him so much. Good trouble, my good trouble partner. Um, uh, as you know, uh, we've been fighting over 10 years in North Carolina to expand Medicaid, and we hope that we are near the finish line on it. Uh, just a, a level set for everyone. You know that in March, the legislature passed a bill to expand Medicaid and came up with a, uh, an agreement on how they would do that. Uh, that process to expand Medicaid uh, does not involve any state funds. It is 90% federal funded and then the 10% state match will be paid by hospitals in a special arrangement with them uh, in, uh, while in addition to allowing them to draw down additional federal payments they can draw down for covering
piece of leverage in the budget process is my hunch. But you know, I'm not, again, I'm not there anymore. So I don't know, I'm not like there and can give you the first hand details. But for that reason, we do not have a set date to launch Medicaid because we don't have a budget. And we never thought that the budget would be in this kind of limbo. We didn't, that didn't seem like a bad deal at the time because we never thought the budget would be in this sort of limbo with them having the majority that they have. But needless to say, politics being what it is, power dynamics being what they are, I guess everybody using every piece of leverage they have, and we don't have a budget. They, another deal was made with the legislature that we could announce an October 1st date. That was about a couple weeks ago, I think that we could have announced a several weeks ago, an October 1st date, because they felt like they would have a budget by September 1st, or they would consider separating Medicaid expansion from the budget, because it doesn't require a, the, a state budget to implement it. Um, now, there's mixed messages in the media about, it looks like they won't have a budget by September 1st, um, there are mixed messages in the media about whether they will take, would, it, would be willing to take separate, separate action to, to decouple Medicaid from the budget so that it can be implemented. If we can't implement Medicaid effective September 1st, uh, there's no way we can do an October 1st start because we have to have federal approval. But of course, the feds are on our side for Medicaid expansion because they fund Medicaid expansion and want Medicaid expansion and are willing to do whatever they can within a reason to expedite Medicaid expansion approval of it at the federal level once we get the state complications resolved. So they have short term, you know, they have reduced everything. We uh, filed stuff in advance. We've done everything we can to be ready to launch, and we're just waiting for the state piece to happen. And everybody is moving help down there to help us, but except for our state legislature, I think. And so the problem is some of the notifications and processes and computer stuff that has to happen to allow these 6,000 people who could potentially be eligible to get on the roll. It takes time for that, and if we can't do it by if we don't get a budget by September 1st to implement October 1st. I mean, sorry, I don't know what. Why? Why there's no one if we're coming on our computer? Wait a minute. Right now, I hope I don't close off the Zoom. Okay, sorry. Um, if we don't get um, if if we can't get it done, meet this September 1st deadline. The next deadline we can hit would be December 1st. And it's just so unfair for people who've been waiting since, for 10 years, and definitely since March, people with illnesses, procedures they need, all kinds of things, people who are on Medicaid uh, from the COVID pandemic and are now uncertified that would now be eligible for them to have to wait ever so many more months to just get in the door, not to of getting to a doctor or a hospital or wherever they need to go. It's just sad and we, and every and we could lose millions of dollars every day of uh, federal money that would be in the state in the healthcare system if we had if we just had that if they would just let us implement. So it's the darnest thing I have ever seen, but this is where we are. Uh, so that's sort of the situation. So it's a you know hold your breath and wait uh, continually. Now that's that political sort of situation. So what will happen when we launch Medicaid? When we launch Medicaid, um, the income limits for people who are eligible will be raised, and for the first time, single adults without children or disabilities of certain income limits will be eligible. That will be the first time ever. So um, you will have single adults who make up to twenty thousand dollars a year, so that would be about a job paying about nine nine dollars and sixty cents an hour. 
those folks would be eligible for Medicaid. That's one thing. Parent, a, 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 parent, a parent and a child making $27,000 a year would now be eligible, where that was like $3,000 or something. I mean, it's, it's a significantly higher income level. A family of three would be $34,000. Um, a family of four would be in the $40,000 range. So, and, uh, and, and these income levels weren't even, they were in single digits. So, now you will have families, and once the mother, the parent is eligible, so will the children be eligible. So you will have lots of families and, and single adults who will be eligible for Medicaid now who were not and would have health insurance coverage. Uh, in addition, we have, uh, I, I think, 300,000 people who are on what's called a family planning benefit who can get family planning services, and these are both men and women who can get um, family planning coverage, but they don't get full Medicaid coverage, they can just get family planning services. Those people will automatically, because their income levels were already higher than the regular Medicaid limit, most of them would automatically be eligible for Medicaid expansion. So on day one, 300,000 people will move from family planning to full Medicaid without doing a thing. The computers will do that themselves. Now they'll, they'll have to take action to get a hit to select the health plan, find a doctor, those kind of things, but they would automatically be eligible. We also imagine that um, about uh, 100,000 people in this, about, uh, yeah, 100,000 people who lost Medicaid due, uh, due to the expanded coverage that was allowed during COVID. During COVID, the federal government suspended recertification of Medicaid so that people who were on Medicaid could keep their health coverage during the pandemic. So that meant that their income went up, they got another job, they worked two jobs, or something, they got married, or you know, whatever happened might have happened to them during COVID, it didn't affect their Medicaid, but that ended in April. And those people have a rolling schedule for being, uh, coming off Medicaid. And, and the main thing for that group is that they need to respond to letters, text messages, information about their recertification, because we believe a lot of those people will probably be eligible for Medicaid expansion. And since they're already in the system, could come in much more easily. And then we think there are those, there are 3,000 of the family planning who will move right away. There are 100,000 of people who are on that got knocked off due to the end of the COVID health emergency. We think they will be eligible. And then we think there are 2,000 people out there, new people in those income categories I just described who will be eligible. So that who would be eligible, and they would be eligible for all of the services that currently are provided uh, with Medicaid insurance coverage, full insurance coverage, uh, comparable to the best insurance that is available in North Carolina for anyone. You know, it's covering behavioral health, physical health, and even uh, some additional um, uh, benefits to support uh, the social driver of health equity like food, transportation, housing support, utility support, additional support, come with that Medicaid expansion. And not lots of jobs and, and, and strengthening of our rural hospitals and health systems. So that's that picture. And actually signing up for Medicaid uh, is mostly controlled by local DSS offices, but there's also something called epass.com, I think is the name of it. I need to get my table to work in front of me, hold on here. Um, where um, you can sign up online, you can, um, uh, hold on one second, let me get this information. Make sure I'm giving you the right one. Hold on. Uh, one second.
Um, okay, it's easypass.northcarolina.gov where you can apply online. Uh, you can, of course, fill out a paper application and send it to a local DSS office, or you can make an appointment and you know, contact your local DSS office and apply. Um, it may take up to 45 days to uh, process your application. There is information you will have to attach. If you apply online, you'll have to know, know how to upload a copy of that information and attach it to your application that verifies or confirms your income and uh, other than your identity and all of that, um, and your age, et cetera. Um, it's, it, I get people from uh, Medicaid, you know, it covers people from age 19 to age 64. Um, uh, so I'm going to stop talking there. And um, uh, take any questions you have about Medicaid expansion. And then I have one other thing I want to mention to you. Secretary Bryant, I'm a true optimist, but what happens if the federal government shut down on September 30th? What kind of government? Who? The federal government. Well, you know, that, that's the federal government shut down. Shut down. That's a bigger. It's a, that's a bigger problem than Medicaid expansion. But um, I don't know. I mean, I don't have that. That's a Don Davis question. I think you want to get Don Davis and Kim in here. Kim, uh, Matt Jones in here to uh, answer that question from the Congressman's office. Thank you. Anyone else with questions? Um, yes, I have a, I did, I have a question. This is Bob mm -hmm. uh, yes, I was uh, Okay, like, uh, they do decide to do the Medicaid expansion in October. Mm -hmm. uh, will they be trying to uh, give the list by trying to make you happy by saying we'll give it to you, but we're not going to give you as much as we said we're going to give you? Uh, well, no, they can't control the the, 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 the the what what is included in Medicaid insurance coverage is already established. Uh, it's established in the bill that was passed in April and established by federal government. You know what's included and what's included in Medicaid coverage is is already established, and so much of that. Uh, anything extra or bells and whistles on that are controlled by uh, our, our department. So I don't think that, that would, the issue would be them trying to, and they, the state is not paying for it. So they don't have any, I mean, I guess they could just try to cut it back from even purposes. But they, but it's, they wouldn't need any money. It's not going to save them any money. There's no state money tied up in Medicaid. It's all federal and, and money from the hospital. And they've already agreed to it, and they want it because they'll make more money, or they at least will not have to cover uncompensated care. They should be able to pay, have a. Everybody they see should have to be paid for it for the first time ever. And now mm -hmm. what ha what happens is those of us with insurance pay for the people who don't have to be bought because of that. And so we should see health care prices. We should see health care prices go down, particularly for those of us in rural areas that have the highest amount proportion of uncompensated care. All of our costs should go down once everybody is paid for. But of course, we'll have to watch that all very carefully. I don't know if that helps answer your question, Bob. Well, yes, yes, you know, but you know, that, uh, I, you know, I guess I'm so used to the uh, being tricked the federal government, and the trick of federal government, sometimes you get tricked on it. Right. Now, the federal government is in favor of Medicaid, at least with the Democratic majority. Right. You know, under the Biden administration, is going to doing everything they can to get you Medicaid coverage with as, as many benefits as possible as we can afford, you know, as the budget will allow, at the federal level. So they are not trying to, they are pro-Medicaid at, at the Biden administration. So they aren't going to do anything to limit you. Now, now, and I hear you that if they, if they get into a negotiation, and you're right, if they get into some kind of negotiation about shutting down the government, you know, everything may be on the table. You follow what I'm saying? Yeah. 
Okay. Okay. So, I mean, anything is possible. I, I do not think, I mean, you know, what you're asking is a very smart question. And I think we got to watch that anyway. We got to watch it for Social Security. We got to watch it for Medicare. We got to watch it for, for education. We got to watch everything. Uh, and we got to vote so that we aren't, so that we have bigger majorities and more control over these things we care about. So, so we need to vote. We got to focus on voting in these municipal elections coming up and then in 24. And you know, the primaries are in March of 24. So we don't need, you know, it's in, that's around the corner. Really. Oh, okay. Oh, yes. All right. You know, thank you. Yeah, we just got some hard work ahead of us, and we can't be sleep. We can't. And like you're doing, we got to look under it. Every little friend for what the trick is. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Other questions? The other thing I want to talk to you all about, any, any other questions on Medicaid expansion? The one thing, we, what do we need you to be doing? Uh, I will send out information to you all so you will have, but we need you to start thinking of the people in your family, community, in your network who would now be eligible. The people uh, making $9.51 an hour or the, the, the parent and the child making $27,000 or the family of three with $34,000. You got to start thinking a year, thinking about who do you know, who are the people working, and these are people working. But they got income, so these are, they're not sitting on the board. These are people with jobs, maybe a full-time couple, working couple, part-time jobs or something. Uh, we need you in construction, in retail, in child care, in um, other kind of maybe some health care jobs, caregiving jobs. These are, we need you to start talking to these folks and talking up this Medicaid health insurance making sure our folks are ready to sign on and get care. And that your health care system in your community is ready, willing, and able to take care of these folks when they sign on. And we'll be getting you more information on that. Okay, so that's what we need from you all on Medicaid expansion. And when we hit live, we're going to need you. Um, also, the uh, uh, civic group is, is uh, included in our external implementation partners group that meets every two weeks. So, uh, um, uh, Ms. Selby and, and our new president, our chair, I just need you all to make sure that, and my pet for Boston, and that's why you can see she turns around and doing the mission. Our, um, make sure that your representatives are in those meetings, I think, every two weeks. Uh, and and I, I think, um, Ms. Selby, you're aware of this, right? And the chair, could you answer me? I wasn't, no. Okay. Well, I'll get a notice out to both of you again, but you need, please make sure that you are, either one of you are representative, some, whoever you designate, are on those meetings. Because that, you get a chance yourself to give input and to have the first-hand knowledge about Medicaid expansion. So I will resend uh, that uh, meeting notice to uh, the two of you, and you all just make sure. You can't have a bunch of people on it now. You just need one representative because it's, you know, a bunch of people on it or something. So you just can't have everybody, but you, you need to make sure you have a representative and that they bring back the information. Yes, um, can you answer me? Okay, one second. information did you all get an email from me about the fish advisories you know there are some advisories about freshwater fish from the local Cape Fear River uh, anybody get that email from me this week nobody seems to remember okay um, in any event there are two community meetings in Dublin 
and in the Bosa. So these may be outside of the Eastern North Carolina Civic Group area. This is in Bladen County, one on August 17th and one on August 22nd, uh, both at 6 o'clock at the Community College in Bladen County on the 17th and on at the um, the Boston Community Center on August 27th uh, to, to discuss the issue of these uh, PFA chemicals uh, in fish in the Lower Cape Fear. Also, the Coastal Federation has a um, um, a uh, one second. I'll tell you about that. Uh, has a campaign. And it is called um, uh, Stop, Check, and Enjoy. So uh, asking people when you uh, are getting freshwater fish from the Lower Cape Fear River to uh, do take certain precautions uh, as you are uh, enjoying, continuing to enjoy uh, and, and benefit from the healthfulness of our fresh fish industry. I'm not familiar with all the details of what to check for and what to recommend, but the North Carolina Coastal Federation has a campaign called Stop, Check, and Enjoy. You can um, go to that, uh, you can Google Stop, Check, and Enjoy or go to that site. Uh, I'll put it in the chat too. Okay. Hold on a minute, I'll put it in the chat. And, and I know that we have people in person, so uh, they won't uh, necessarily be able to see what's in the chat. Uh, but some of you um, uh, can, uh, can check this out. Uh, just to be on the lookout about eating freshwater fish uh, from our uh, uh, coastal plain and river system and educating yourself on that. And if you want more information on that, I can bring somebody back to talk to you on that um, and make sure I get information out to you about with more information on that. So I'm going to stop there. Any questions on that? The fish advisor and the public meetings that are happening. Secretary Bryant. Yes. Could you send it to me so I can post it on my um, page? I will. I will send it to you. Send it to you now. Okay, and are there any other questions for me? Or things I can answer for you that you're running into in your community? Uh, from a health and human service standpoint. How much of a concern do you have for, um, for the uprise in, in, in COVID, the increase in COVID? Oh, good point, good point. Oh, yes, I forgot that. Yes, COVID is on the increase, and we expect it will be on the increase in terms of what we see in the wastewater uh, testing that we're doing, which is now the major way that we are monitoring it. We don't, we aren't monitoring cases and all of that anymore because we don't have, uh, you know, the recording and all that. It's not like it was during the pandemic. And so many people are self-testing, so we don't have the, uh, the the source of data to use. Our major source is on what the waste that we all produce is what we're testing, and it's showing us a, a significant increase. And our epidemiologists expect that increase will continue into the fall, into the school season. So we think it is appropriate to exercise, particularly those of us who are most vulnerable. You know, people over the age of 60, people with uh, com uh, compromising or uh, 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 complicated uh, health con uh, conditions uh, to take extra precautions. So I would pull those masks back out, put some sanitizer in the pocket, and keep my distance, you know. Um, uh, and, um, and just be kept, you know, I wouldn't engage in any big crowds and big gatherings you know, in the next couple of months that I don't have to, um, you know, that aren't essential. You know, if, if you feel like you're at risk or you're with, living with or taking care of somebody. So this is the time to now um, 
just become more careful. And make sure your uh, shot boosters and all that are up to date. And there will be a new booster in September for people who there's already a current booster, I think since May, March, or I think since May. So if you haven't gotten that booster and you're over, I think 50, I think 50 age, I have to look it up. Uh, uh, get that, you need to get that booster and, and, and there'll be a new one in September. Uh, okay. And there will also be shots in September, and I'll get one of you next time more information about this. There are also shots for what's called RSV, this respiratory virus that is now becoming more common, particularly for older people, and there will be the regular flu shot. So um, it will be important to, and apparent, and we still think the current vaccine that's available to being used for boosters um, will be still uh, um, active against the new strains of COVID that are being, uh, that are now being, you know, that have now been identified uh, in the wastewater. So far, our current vaccines are, the latest bivalent booster vaccine uh, is, is effective. So, and with children going back to school, we want to make sure the children are up to date with what they need and uh, that they can get up get information from the schools about what their, what their precautions are. And when somebody gets sick, keep them home, go check, make sure you got home tests available at home on a regular basis that are up, up to date. If you got one or two in the house, if you need, you know, somebody's feeling down sick or get sick. So you're not running around trying to find a test, you know, and all of that. Yeah? Uh, okay. Uh, are, are you saying that there, that there will be a booster in September? I'm yes, there will be a new booster shot available in September for people who've already had all the other boosters. Like I got one in May, I think. Not May, March. I have to look it up on my phone. Like it may be in March that I got it. And there'll be one in September that, uh, uh, will be available if you got if you got one by May. If you didn't get one by May, I think you can still get that one, the one that's available now. But there will be a new one, an additional one available in September. Thank you. Secretary, Secretary Bryant, uh, first of all, thank you for attending. Um, my question is, when you are going out testing uh, the wastewater water, are you alerting the health departments in the area of the situation? How is that being put out so we'll know where uh, those uh, epicenters are growing? Um, there is information on our website. Uh, we report that information on our website. Um, and, um, and, and we don't do every location. We do certain locations. That there is a map of the location. There's a strategy on how we do it across the state. Let me see if I can pull up anything on that. Put it enough to answer the question. Wastewater surveillance. Okay. Yeah, we have a wastewater monitoring dashboard. Let's see what it says. And I can put that uh, link in the chat. And um, I'm putting it in the chat now. Uh, and let me pull this up to see what it is. Uh, uh, okay, it, um, so it just get, it shows the particles going up and down per week. And I don't see, I, I presume there might be a map. I have to study this, the data behind, I think COVID-19 hospitalization. What wastewater monitoring? Uh, summary, data behind the dashboard, especially if it's this or that. Uh, okay. I have to study this a little bit more, but most of what you get is uh, you get the wastewater amount in the aggregate, and, they, and you get to see it going up and down. 
Uh, okay, here they are. They're doing the math. Okay, uh, I'm a, I can share my screen. Uh, can anybody, if I share my screen, can you all see it there? Is that worthwhile or no? Yeah. I, you know, no, I don't want to. I, 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 I was just looking up on the, uh, the uh, okay. line. Okay. You said. Okay. In the chat, you have a bar graph. There are two things you have at least. You have a bar graph that shows you the total number going, and you will see that it's going up in the state. It's not as high as it was during like the Omicron peak problem, but it's, it's a steady incline, you'll see that. There's also a map with dots showing you where in, in the state at the various sites they check what percentage um, of um, Particles per million or whatever it is, uh, they uh, they are finding and where is redder, you know, and where they are hot spots. And so you can see those, and some of those hot spots are in eastern North Carolina. Uh, and you can, uh, but, but in the Triangle and like in Pitt County and in Hanover and Cumberland, but these, these are also where you got population centers uh, in the east. Those are some of the, uh, of course, the bigger cities were Wilson, uh, Rona Rapids. So they, they, they have the, you can see across the state where they're doing the testing. And what, they, what they're using to make their predictions. They're also continuing to track hospital admissions and emergency room visits, uh, and they are going up. So they use the combination of wastewater, Hospital visits and emergency room visits. And of course, the only thing about hospital and emergency room visits is you don't know those until after the fact, you know, after the people get sick. Wastewater, we can know probably before people ever get sick. You see what I'm saying? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. okay. Good questions, though. Y'all are, y'all are. Uh, 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 this is Bob uh, Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I have a two-part question. Uh, do you think that uh, COVID-19 is going to uh, have a surge like last time? And do you think the government and all the prevent this going to take cautionary uh, measures and funding okay. to stop, stop that uh, uh, surge? Uh, well, let me say this. The one thing we know is we have tools in the toolbox that we didn't have during the pandemic. Okay? First thing is we have a plenty, we got a population, a significant percentage of which have already had COVID, so they have that uh, herd immunity, as you call it. Even though that herd immunity is not as strong, it wanes over time, and our experts are saying against these new strains, that herd immunity, like if you had it two years ago or something, it's not as much of a protection as if you had it last week. So. Um, the, the, the fact that you had COVID is not as much of a protection now as, as time passes. So we're so we're losing some of that, but we have more of that. So for whatever protection that does provide, we have that. We have at-home tests, so people can get tested on their own. They don't have to stand in a line, get an appointment, go to the health department. You don't have to do anything. You can test yourself and protect yourself. Stay at home, keep your family at home. You know, test people coming to the family reunion or whatever. We can, we can, we can also take steps ourselves. We know that masking and distancing works, so we can implement that. We have a lot more activities in our community, like churches, everything from churches and funerals to, you know, other kind of events that are virtual, so people have options. You, know, you don't have to go in a lot of different things until you can protect yourself. And we have these vaccines that we know work. So what we know is that even if, if we have a surge, people, we don't expect that people will be as sick or that people will die. That we at least think that the vaccine will keep people living. It can, may not keep people from getting it, but it will be a milder case and, and require less, like people on ventilators and stuff like that, less, less uh, complex care and less hospitalization. That's what we expect, and that's what we've seen so far. People are getting it, but they're not—they're not as sick. 
However, the people who are older and with complicated, uh, what do they call it, uh, comorbidities, people who have multiple conditions, heart disease, kidney disease, diabetes, and other kinds of complications, uh, are immunocompromised, cancer um, survivors, stuff like that. Those folks are at more risk of getting seriously ill, and that's what you don't want to have. People in um, congregate settings who don't have a choice, you know, nursing homes, healthcare. And once it starts spreading in the community, then it's going to get into the nursing homes and the assisted living facilities. Because people go visit and they work there and whatever. So that's why we have to tamp it down to try to protect the people who, if they get sick, they will be seriously ill. So I, I hope I think I hope that answers the question. We aren't expecting like a pandemic situation. Now you know, God is in control. Um, okay. uh, we just made a problem on your extra funding to make sure that everybody can get it. Well, most of the COVID funding that we've already received is still we we are still spending that uh, through like May and June of next year. So the COVID money is still flowing. You know, like all in the, the PHHS, almost all of the folks who had COVID money, unless they've all, unless it's already been used, uh, people they have still COVID money to that is you know that's being spent as we speak. Okay, uh, Now the other thing is uh, that we have too is treatment. You know, we have Paxlovid, we have good drugs. Hey. Uh, for COVID, I forgot that. You just have to make sure you get to the doctor. You get COVID or get something, get to the doctor and get treatment early. Don't wait till you're down and out and can't move out of bed or whatever. As soon as you start having symptoms or get a positive test, go on and get checked out. So that if you're a person who would need medicine, need treatment, you can get it. And so there is also good treatment for COVID. All right. Thank you. Okay, these are y'all are asking good questions. Anybody else? Uh, are there still Secretary Bryant? Bryant, are there still uh, free testing kits available? There are not any free testing kits available. We are, we are completely out and out of harm. So now you're in. To, you have to, uh, I guess, get them at the drugstore or uh, we don't. Uh, some insurance programs or health programs or you know, like if you own Medicaid or something. That, you know. Your health plan, you may have some available at the health department or the community health center. But we don't have any more at the DHS. At DHS. Well, good time, you can go online and get at least about 5 or 10. Right. I don't think that's available anymore, as far as I can tell. But I would need to check at your health department and, and, the, and the community health center to see what they may have. Okay. Oh. Yeah. And I presume that that's one thing, that would be an easy thing for the government to provide if they were going to provide something. So, you know, I presume that might be one of the first things that might come back online if we get into a problem. Yes, Major? Yes, Major. Um, I just wanted to ask about
Thank you so much, Secretary Warren. And, and, I'm, and I'm surely at your disposal. Betty can get me, Camilla can get me, you can get me, Mr. Chair, uh, Mr. President. Everybody on this call can get me out, you know, do what I get, get to you or get somebody to you if I can. Again, so, thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank you for all you do. And just in closing, I want, I want you all to just, just take in everything that's been said today. We started out, uh, one of our reports was on the Values Committee. Understand how many people vote against their own interests. We just heard her say that the Medicaid expansion uses no state funds, but yet they tied it to the state budget. But yet we go out and vote for these folks that get in office and do things against our own interests. That's why the folks that's on that values committee, it is so important that we do it and do it right. That we can put out a report card that people will understand if I vote for this person, I see they are against this, 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 and this that affects my household. The, the, the structure of the civic group is that when we meet, that you take this information back to your community. You all have my pool to take back to your community today. Justin, what Secretary Brown gave us. So take this back to your community and pass the word. Uh, Betty, I do have a report that two counties did uh, pay their assessment fee, and that, yes. that is Edgecombe County and Washington County. Martins and Martin. So we had three counties pay their assessment today. Betty, did you, Betty, did you hear me? We need that in the records. And I, I want to thank uh, Jeremy Collins as we bring this meeting to a close today. We want to thank Jeremy for providing us the meeting place. And he's also going to feed you. So don't go any place. Thank you. We're going to get some fried fish. Mm -hmm. My favorite. So we're going to get that. And we want to thank uh, Brother Dancy for reaching out to Secretary Brian. Thank you. And for also broadcasting this meeting. Commissioner Biggs for her presence in the meeting today. And all of you that are here. Thank you so much. And I know we had something else on the uh, agenda, but we would now accept a motion to adjourn. Mr. President, where you going? Okay, well, you can see it. Hello, to everybody. Go on my website and see this. You can go over there and look at it. Thank you. What is your website? Right. Right. The banquet. Uh, 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 Vice, Vice President Matthews said to me, all, with all that we've heard, the banquet is still on for next week. <laughs> it's still on. <laughs> now, if you don't feel good, wear your mask. <laughs> all right. Um,
And with you on, we're not going to let you leave this meeting without doing something. So we're going to ask you to have a word and then to bless the food that we are about to receive. Praise the Lord. I am delighted to be on today. I remember when my husband and I went every week to every meeting that he passed away almost three years ago. So we are still on giving it the same I do again. And I just thank God for you, you, and you. Heavenly Father, and if I be for your precious name of Jesus, Heavenly Father, we have to do just the food that we're about to receive, Heavenly Father. And the Father, as we eat, Heavenly Father, let's eat to the glory of God, realize that there are so many Heavenly Fathers that don't have anything to eat. And the Father, we ask that you bless us in a special way. Let us break bread together, Heavenly Father. And one day, Heavenly Father, in the time is over for us, O oh God, to eat bread together in heaven. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, pray the Lord. Amen. 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 Reverend Samson, we are coming to Craven County the second Saturday in October. So we pray the Lord. We hope to see you. You will. All right. Pray the Lord. All right. All right. Have a blessed day, everybody. All right. So it's been moved. Second meeting is adjourned. Thank you all so much. For my county folks, uh, I can't prepare.